Amen. Good morning. morning. Welcome home. Homecoming 2022. And uh, in case you haven't noticed, we've got some special reserve seats in the back over here uh, by the sound booth. We have the, the Atwood reserved box for Herman, Bootsy, and Cindy. Wonderful to have you all with us today. I know it's been a long and tiring journey, but it's good to have you here on Homecoming Sunday. And in the back uh, there, we have the Dasher uh, reserve seated box there. I don't know how much they pay for those tickets, but <laughs> good to have all of you. So all of, many of you who have returned and you've been away for a while, welcome back. It's a pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Uh, we have so much going on that we're very proud of what's happening here at First Christian Church of Atlanta. I do want to say uh, real quickly, we have a, a, a young member of the congregation who is a deacon, very committed to our service, uh, but he has a job where he manages a number of restaurants, and you know what the conditions are right the, like these days. So I want to give a shout out online to Robert Pecorino, and because he wants to be here. But he's not been able to. I know that's been a very frustrating thing, so we want to keep him in our prayers. Also, we have uh, probably many birthdays and anniversaries that we haven't been able to celebrate for various reasons. So we want to honor those now, but we also especially want to honor uh, Millie Rivers, who was here with us today. She has a birthday this Friday. Yeah. And who who else has got a birthday? Ruth. Okay. No, I, I, was, I was looking at her. I don't know. Where did I point? Okay. Millie is having a birthday on Friday. Of course, now, Millie is Miss First Christian as far as I'm concerned. And uh, Millie came to this congregation at the age of five. And she can remember her first Sunday school teacher and I'm going to break protocol and tell you that she will be 101 on Friday. <laughs> Shall we sing happy birthday? go through a couple of announcements real quickly. First of all, today is the day in which we are supposed to turn in our commitment cards for the stewardship drive. If you have those, you can either drop those in the offering plate when it comes by, or you can give those to Diane Holiday, or pass those along to a deacon or an elder, or to me if you like. But this is the day. Out in the narthex, you see that there are a number of sign-up tables or sign-up lists out there. And we had a couple of, of our goons out there to sort of you know, break kneecaps for people who didn't go by and sign it. But basically, we're asking for people to sign up to volunteer for various activities that are coming up in the near future. One of those, of course, is the fall festival we will be hosting on October the 22nd. If you will sign up your name, we have various opportunities. Anne will get with you uh, once you sign on that list, but it could be running a game. It could be providing snack foods or whatever. She will get with you on that. Some of the other things uh, that are out there are um, escaping my mind, but, but you'll see them when you get out there. We try to make sure we cover all the ages and all the uh, ability levels. But we also have out there this sheet of paper. It probably looks a little bit familiar because it looks like the flyer that went out a few weeks ago. But what it is, it says opportunities to serve, and, these, and it says time underneath. And these are some various things that you can consider donating your time or your talent for. And then, of course, we have here from Jonathan Clark a sample. Did you know that if you came to church every Sunday in a year, you have given 52 hours to the church just by being part of the worship service? You know, if you attend a few events, volunteer at some special occasions, you would in no time accumulate 70, 80, or 100 hours. I know we have people who have been here this week have probably given us 20 or 30 or 40 hours just preparing for this homecoming. And if you've seen the beautiful decorations, 
the wonderful gardening out there. And as we go back to the fellowship hall and you see all this back there, it's wonderful. And so we have so many people who have given so much. And uh, so kudos to all of you. Very quickly, let me uh, just run through a couple of announcements and we'll get the worship service started. So if we go ahead with the next slide. Here are some of the things that you can volunteer for or be part of. At the top left, you see the Tucker Young Festival Singers. This is our children's program on Wednesday night. We have somewhere around 22 children who have been attending that. And of course, two Sundays ago, they came and performed. And we had a crowd just like this one here. And so we're continuing to work to build a children's program as we find this church growing and regrowing. Next to that, you see math tutoring, another one of our great outreaches to the community. And math tutoring is uh, ongoing. I know Kirk had at least one student today, and it's, it's been a real blessing. He has donated his time. But sometimes students come for help, and they need to bring their siblings along, and he needs an, another adult who can come and assist him with those siblings. So we do have a volunteer sign-up list out there for assisting with tutoring. And basically that would be playing games with the siblings and so forth, right? We also have a nursery sign-up. Uh, top right, networks. We continue to donate non-perishable food items to networks. This congregation is among the top uh, congregations in Tucker that donates non-perishable foods to networks, which is our local food cooperative. Bottom left, Tucker Community Singers. I think the only thing I need to say about that today is we have a concert on November the 18th or 19th? 19th, thank you, which is a Saturday, and it's going to feature the Tucker Community Singers, the Tucker Young Festival Singers, which are our children's group, and the Tucker Community Orchestra. It's going to be big. It's going to be really nice. So mark November the 19th on your calendars. Uh, I think that's all for this slide. What do we have up there next? Coming up in a few weeks, of course, we will have a uh, Red Cross blood drive on October the 10th, which is next week. But obviously, they're desperate for blood uh, down in Florida with the Hurricane Ian. I know the death count yesterday was around 77. I think it's probably gone above that now. Hospitalizations are rampant. So uh, they are asking for all kinds of donations. And so we share that with you. Call 1-800-RED-CROSS. Or those of you who are savvy with the phone, Text IAN to 90999, and you can make a $10 donation to that. Next slide, please. Just want to show you some pictures of sort of the before and after of the women's retreat. We had 12 ladies, but actually, if you count them on both screens there, there's about 14 ladies who were down at Epworth by the Sea at a women's retreat, and that was wonderful. We want to keep that rolling. Next slide, please. There we go. I've mentioned the Fall Festival. Again, there's a sign-up list out there. It's great outreach to the community, so we definitely want to uh, let people know about it, and we would love to have your participation. And if you don't feel like you can paint faces or make popcorn or whatever, maybe you can bake cookies or make goodie bags and send them ahead. So there's all kinds of ways that can be helpful there. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so the Disciples of Christ has a regional assembly once a year. It's been a few years because of COVID since we've done that, but we have regional assembly coming up. Anne is going to be directing the regional assembly choir. I will be speaking at the men's luncheon, so we'd love to bring a cadre of people from this congregation. And by the way, all of you Bulldogs fans, it's in Athens, just so you know. Next slide, please. I think, all right, so I did already give out sort of a good job, and uh, I think we better get on with the service because that food isn't going to get any fresher if I keep talking, right? All right, welcome to homecoming. Let us begin. Good morning. And as Tom said, welcome home to First Christian Church of Atlanta. It's great to see all of you out there this morning. And uh, if you would stand now for our opening hymn of...
welcome members of the church. Join the moment, Mr. Tucker Barrow. Welcome, Tucker. Thank you for being here. Um, well, I'm going to start out with Tucker. <coughs> Tell me, um, what does church mean to you? Church means gathering together in communion and respecting one another. Oh, that's very, uh, well, I'll remember that on days when I'm going, why do I want to go to church? <laughs> um, do you find that it um, helps you in a daily way, you know, like Monday through Saturday? Does it, do you find, I mean, it might not, but you think it does? Yes, if you treat everyone equally, then they will be nice to you back, allowing you to get more things done. Well, I'm going to remember that, too. That's a very good lesson. Well, uh, we have several young people here. Now, what would you share with them about um, church and faith? Just walk over there. Church and faith isn't just about believing in the Lord and that he's all-powerful. Yes, it does have a big part, but it's also about how you interact with others. If you are mean to someone, they are not going to like you and won't help you in the future. But if you're nice to them, then they'll help you back. That can be really useful in situations like if your car breaks down and you need help. Well, that was just super. Thank you. Good job. I appreciate that. Bravo. Thank you. Please come again. All right. Thank you. That was wonderful, wasn't it? You guys didn't know that Tucker was such a uh, good public speaker either, did you? Oh, you didn't know that. Well, now, you, now it's just confirmed. That was wonderful. If, uh, if you had been here a year ago, we would have been hit or miss with children's moments. And now here we are. We have a children's moment every Sunday, except... I'm happy to say that that was the last of our children's moments. Do you know why? Because now we have children's church. Not a hit or miss, not a once in a while thing, but a regular every Sunday children's church program. So after, generally speaking, after communion, we dismiss the children to children's church. Today, we will dismiss them after the anthem. And so now we have in swing, full swing, a children's program. So that is just one of the signs of God's work in our congregation. Uh, today, of course, we do a lot of the regular things that we do during the normal uh, Sundays of the year and uh, also on special occasions, and one of those is a time of community prayer. I've always viewed it as the role of the pastor at this time is to try to say the things that are affecting all of us, all the things that are on our hearts and in our minds, but also give you an opportunity to participate in the prayer by having a moment of silence. So I will begin to pray, and then towards the end I will say, in this moment of gathered worship, hear us as we pray from the silence of our hearts, and I will pause for a couple of minutes and give you the opportunity to share with God words of praise and gratitude, but also words of care and concern. So let us now together, both as individuals, but also as the body of Christ, let us go before the throne of God, and let us share with him our cares and our concerns. Let us pray. It is always good to go home, O oh God. We are grateful that our final home is with you, for that is where our hearts belong. But until that day comes, it is wonderful to return to our earthly roots and to celebrate the sense of joy and familiarity we feel when we come home. Homecoming reminds us that the whole earth is yours and that whatever and wherever we go, we are still part of a larger family. We thank you for the things about home that remain comfortable to us, the good people we knew, the memories that are rekindled when we return, the places where we once sang and prayed, the church where we still sing the old songs, pray real prayers, and declare the gospel the same old way. And we thank you for what those returning bring to us 
and a sense of freshness, a reminder that there is a world out there beyond the one that we know, a witness to the power of the church and the congregation to draw them back, and a testimony to the way the gospel continues to go out from this place to the farthest corners of the earth. Give us an assurance that life goes on and is good, and the knowledge that our fellowship in you can never be broken regardless of how far we roam or what we do. Let the Spirit of Christ reign in our hearts today and make us glad together. And may your name be glorified in the renewal we experience. For you are our God, and we have never forgotten you. And now, in this moment of gathered worship, hear us as we pray from the silence of our hearts. Be with us and abide with us, O God, and hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. While the people of God wandered in the desert, God provided manna from heaven, water from a rock, and a law to guide their way and to shape their life together. God has fed us too and stayed with us every moment of our own journey so that we are never alone. We are here today to be fed and to gather strength in numbers and in the spirit of God so we can reach out in ministry to the world God loves. Will the deacons please come forward to collect the offering? Yeah. 
offering today. With it, we worship you and give our whole selves to you. Please now take it and use it for your kingdom and your glory. Extend and multiply its reach and influence. May it be a great blessing to many. We ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. One of the keystones of our denomination, the Disciples of Christ, is that the Lord's Supper is a part of our weekly worship. So as the disciples in the New Testament met to break bread, on every first day of the week, we meet to worship, to pray, and to break bread as well. We want you to know if you're worshiping with us for the first time, you too are invited to participate. In our church, we do not screen people or put up any kind of uh, test of fellowship. You are welcome to participate. And we have two ways of partic partaking of the Lord's Supper. One way, as you see, we have elders here who are putting on gloves and getting ready to pray. They're going to pray over the bread and the cup, and they will come down, and they will have them available for anyone who wants to come around and receive it from them. Over here, we have at the table here with our two deacons, uh, some disposable, what we call personal chalices, right? And they have uh, the bread on one side and the uh, juice on the other side with a very easy to peel off paper seal. And so we also welcome you who desire to partake of it that way to come and to receive one of these. We also have a deacon in the back in case anyone 
needs to remain seated but would like to partake. Uh, when you see them come around, just show them your hand and they will see that you get it. But please, feel free to partake with us because this table belongs to the Lord and he has restricted no one from it, so we dare not do the same. I mean, we dare not do any otherwise. I'll get my words right here in a minute. <laughs> so the Lord's Supper communion is a type of a homecoming. In it, we sort of gather for a meal. I know that you're not going to leave here full, but that anyway, the meal is the bread and the cup. We share that meal with the Lord and with all of our family who are gathered here in this place, but also with all the people who share our faith around the world at this moment and also in the past and in the future. All believers at all times, all who believe and have called upon the name of Christ. But on a special day like a homecoming Sunday today, we get the added pleasure of sharing this holy time with some of you who have returned for the first time in, in a number of years. And that's a real joy that we get to share this holy time that we have missed with each other. And as we look around the room, I'm sure that all of us, our hearts are filled with nostalgia for the days that have passed and for the days that we have so uh, warmly treasured up in our hearts. Isn't this a picture of what that great banquet is going to be like one day when we are all united in heaven? The Lord's Supper is a type of homecoming that we celebrate every week but it, yet it points us to that great homecoming above. Let us now approach the Lord's Supper in that spirit. And for the words of institution, I have received of the Lord what I have also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. As the bread at the Lord's table is broken, it is done so as our Savior did. As we eat the bread... Let us cherish his love. Let us attest to our faith in the Lord. Let us know the wholeness he brings to us. Indeed, let's be joyful at being at his table, for this practice is our sacred, sacred covenant with the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, as we take this cup, representing your blood shed for us, we realize that you were the supreme sacrifice for all of our sins, past, present, and future. Because of your sacrifice, we can be free from the power and penalty of sin. In your precious name we pray. Amen. We welcome all of you to come as the elders come down to receive the bread and the cup or to come to this table and to receive the bread and the cup.
The scripture this morning is from Luke 15, verses 25 through 32. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked, what's going on? He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fat calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became very angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. When this son of yours came back, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Also from Romans 11, verses 17 through 18. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted among the others to share the rich root of the olive tree, do not boast over the branches. If you do boast, remember, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. This is the word of our Lord. Amen.
Morning, Craig. Homecoming Sunday. It's a great day, isn't it? Yeah? Depending on where you look in the archives, this congregation was started either in 1848, 1851, or 1853. You know, there's a cornerstone out in the narthex, which you may have seen. Now, there's actually a slide that you can look at. Uh, just a second. It'll be up there probably. Uh, this says First Christian Church organized in 1853. This building erected in 1906. That one is out there. And so sometimes, I mean, just to show you how people get confused, people will come in and they'll see that stone and they'll say, well, this building was built in 1906? <laughs> no, this building was built in about, I think, 1975. So uh, that, which brings up an interesting thing, you know, um, if you go back and look at the history of this congregation and you realize that, well, let me just go ahead and say, we're going to come down in the middle and say 1851. Is that okay with everybody? 1851. We're, we're agreed on that, right? Early in our congregation's existence, around November the 15th, 1864, I'm waiting for a Louis Grizzard joke to pop out here somewhere. In 1864, November the 15th, Sherman burned the first Christian church of Atlanta's building. Yeah, okay. Less than 100 years later, on November the 5th, 1957, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution announced or reported that 80 Atlanta pastors signed a manifesto on racial beliefs. Uh, did I say November the 5th? Yes, but this, it was signed on November the 3rd. Two Pastors from First Christian Church of Atlanta signed their names to this document. Harrison McMains and James W. Sosby. Many of you knew Jim Sosby. And that, um, a framed version of that article is in our church library in case you haven't seen it. And this happened after uh, the, uh, the incidents in Little Rock, Arkansas. This was during the days of uh, integration or desegregation and so forth. Now, by today's standards, the wording of that document is kind of cautious in its wording, but it does name racial injustice and calls for all citizens, even the white citizens of the South, to obey the law. And again, two of our ministers from this congregation had signed their names to that document. Now, I want to ask you to get a little bit involved. Many of you who have returned or some of you have been here all along. How many congregations have been launched from the First Christian Church of Atlanta? Well, name a couple. Peachtree Christian Church, you know that big Gothic cathedral on, on Peachtree Street? That church <laughs> was an, an outgrowth of this church, right? And if I remember correctly, Bootsy, you grew up right around the corner from there, didn't you? You grew up right around the corner from where Peachtree Christian Church is now. Somewhere around Atlantic Station? Midtown, okay. And you could walk to church at one time. Or am I wrong? Yes. There you go. Prior Street. That's what I was trying to remember. Prior Street. Thank you so much. All right. So... Obviously, 1848, 1851, 1853, I get all the facts a little jumbled up sometimes, but thank you for that. Peace Street Christian Church, name another one. I can't hear you. Ray of Hope Christian Church, right? Just to name a couple birthed from this congregation. If you are a lifetime member of FCCA, and some of you are lifetime members, and by that I mean you were born into this church, would you... Please stand. Look at there. Now, yeah. I 
I won't, I won't give you numbers, okay? But let's just say that 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90 are all kind of appropriate there. And of course, we have, uh, we've already celebrated Millie today, who's been a member here longer than all of you lifetime members have, but she came here at the age of five. So we have a wonderful congregation. In fact, uh, Cindy, aren't you fourth generation? Fourth generation. And Joel Grayson, you are third generation? Fourth generation. There you go. So we have a long and dignified history, if you see that, right? Today, First Christian Church of Atlanta is what I call a family-sized church. We have about 75 to 80 members. A century ago, there were about 1,000 members, okay? But just six years ago, there were about 30, okay? So as we think about the last 170 years or so, we can see that this congregation has had good days and bad days, right? Ups and downs, peaks and valleys, whatever you want to call them. We believe that we are now experiencing a time of growth and rebirth. It was on November the 6th, 2016. That, number, that month of November just keeps popping up. November the 6th, 2016, I delivered my first sermon as the official pastor of this congregation. And in that statement, or in that sermon, I made the following statement. I did not come to you to be your undertaker. I came to be your midwife. I feel like those words are coming true. And the rebirth that we see that's going on around us. An ancient Greek philosopher named Heraclitus, you may not know the name, but you probably have heard his famous saying that you can never stop, step into the same river twice. You know this saying? You can't stop, step into the same river twice. Obviously, this is simply because the stream is constantly flowing, right? Just like time is constantly flowing. What is past has gone on. What is future is still upstream somewhere. It's not yet come. But there's also the river of the present that we are currently stepping in. The stream of First Christian Church of Atlanta began somewhere around 1851 and has flowed, flowed through history for 171 or so years. There have been times when, metaphorically speaking, the rains have swelled the river that it threatened to overflow the banks. And at other times, the drought has threatened to take the river down to dangerously low levels. But today we celebrate, if I continue the metaphor, is that okay? Showers of blessings in which we see that the water levels are rising again. So here are a few thoughts to meditate on as we consider this. First, even those of you who have been lifetime members of this church or members of this church for 60, 70, 80, or 90 years, do you realize that you're still kind of newcomers compared to the age of this church, right? Even you, when you took on leadership in this congregation, you were a newcomer to somebody, to somebody who was like a, had been, been here for a while. But then again, what is 171 years compared to 2,000 years of church history? In that sense, we are all newcomers. Best of all, we are always happy to welcome new faces, new members, new people into this family. So, you know, if I have said nice things about people who have been here for 50, 60, 70, 80 years, that's not in any way to diminish those of us who have been here for less than 10, right? It just is to say that we are all part of this stream and we all have come in at different times. In fact, this year, thanks to a lot of hard work for our nominating committee led by Joel Grayson and, and others, we have had a bumper crop of new leadership. We have more deacons this year than we have had in anybody's memory. We have more committee members and more committee chairs, new committee chairs, than we have had since anyone can remember. And we have a lot of people who have taken on leadership 
and have gone forward. We have had our second uh, stewardship drive this year, and last year was our first one, and these are the first ones we've done in anybody's memory, and taken over by our new uh, stewardship chair, Jonathan Clark, and has done a wonderful job of uh, getting the word out and helping people see all the different ways that we can give, not just of our money, but of our time and of our talents and our gifts. So now, what is the trick? Long-time members, new members, some of us who are in between, what is the trick? I have a new metaphor for you. It's called the berry bucket. Okay? The berry bucket comes from a guy named Carl George, and he describes the dynamics of church leadership and church growth in this book. When a church gets a new minister, so let's say, go back to November the 6th, 2016, when I became your new minister, all of the members of the church at that time, the existing members are what we call the original berries. Now, Carl George calls them the old berries, but I'm going to say original berries, okay, because I think that's nicer. And so that's you guys. All of you who were members of this church when I came, you are my original berries, okay? And... Please don't feel bad, but I'm putting you all in this bucket right here, okay? You are the original berries. This bucket cannot increase its numbers because it represents the people that that were here when I came. It can decrease in numbers, and it has because people have died and people have moved away and so forth. So we're calling you the original berries. From this moment forward, Anyone who joins the church is what we call a new berry. Makes sense, right? And so you all go into this bucket of new berries. They go into this bucket, and of course, if we put this on a fulcrum, we put this on a seesaw, uh, you'll see a picture uh, like this coming up here in just a minute. It's coming. Uh, It'll be here in a minute. There we go. No problem. And by the way, guys, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you feel pressure back there. (laughs) Um, So remember now, this is just an analogy, all right? We're not posing one group against the other. That's not what's happening here. It's just an analogy. We're not pitting anybody. On the contrary, this is a way of describing the reality of what happens when new leadership comes into an existing program. Now, I've been in churches where a new pastor comes in, he starts, you know, firing people and sending people away, and they try to start from the beginning. That's not what we try to do here. It is my goal that these new berries will find a place of belonging along with the original berries, right? But that takes conscious effort on our part so that the berry bucket analogy is designed to make us aware of the dynamics of of this sort of thing. So at the beginning of the ministry, the the original berry bucket or the old berry bucket outweighs the new bucket, plain and simple. But when the church grows, new members come along, people transfer in, babies are born, and whatever, what happens to that new berry bucket? It gets a little heavier, right? And that fulcrum begins to shift its weight a little bit. And if members from the original berry bucket continue to leave or they pass away, the, you know, whatever, the bucket gets lighter and so forth. So you see the purpose of the analogy. It's about balance. It's about making a point to honor both groups, honor the past, honor the dedication, and, uh, but also look to the future and prepare for the future and somewhere in between to cultivate those relationships so that the original berries and the new berries are working together and learning from each other. In any healthy organization, not just a church, but whatever business you belong to or did belong to, you know that it's a healthy practice to have what's called a succession plan, right? So that when you have people that are getting near retirement, you have others who are coming up behind them that are learning how to do the job and will carry it on uh, efficiently. Here at First Christian Church of Atlanta, I think that we have done a pretty good job of it. I think we have done a great job of finding uh, ways of integrating our new berries with our original berries and working them together in in various programs and things, and we're always trying to make sure that we we do that. But I thought it'd be nice to look at a couple of passages of Scripture. One, 
sort of directed towards the old berries, I mean the original berries, and one directed towards the new berries, just to kind of help us put things in perspective. For the original berries, I chose Luke 15, verses 25 through 32. And you know, this is that part of the parable of the prodigal son that we typically skip over, right? Because we want to talk about the son who left home and went to Vegas and blew all of his money in the casinos and the, what do you call those places? This is church. So what do I call those places in church? Houses of ill repute or whatever. Whatever he was doing, he, you know, he went to Vegas and he, he lived it up until he was dirt poor and living on a pig farm, right? And then he comes home. And his father receives him with love and grace and prepares this great feast. This, shall we call it a homecoming feast? And then there's that son, hardworking, dedicated. You know how it is. If you've got an older sibling, you know that they always are a martyr for some reason, right? Aren't they? Uh, wait, how many of you are the firstborn in your family? Okay, stick your fingers in your ears for what I'm about to say. If you have an older sibling, didn't they always act like they're your mom or your dad? They always try to lord it over you. Now, you're not going to invent that because you're afraid you're going to get in trouble. Maybe it's not true for you. Seems like it's true for me. But I've always been home. I've always been with dad. I've always done my job. Here comes this, this, yeah, Amy knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> I know there's going to be a fight later. I'm sorry about that. Uh, you know, I raised two sons, and because of that, I totally understand Cain and Abel. That's all I'm going to say about that. Totally get that. Where was I? Anyway, the, the son, the prodigal son, comes home. And I should mention that the word prodigal does not mean sinful. It means wasteful. I don't know if you knew that, but it, since this stewardship drive, making good use of our finances and so forth. What did he do? He, he, he spent all of his money. That's called prodigality. That's a word that we don't hear much anymore, so I thought it was worth mentioning. The other, older son who stayed home and was a good boy and worked on the farm and followed dad's instructions and did whatever, he was kind of an original berry because he was committed. He was invested. He stayed and he did his job. And we can all sympathize with his feelings. We can all sympathize with the older child. I have two granddaughters now, an older one and a younger one. The younger one, she's just carefree. The older one is a little bit stressed now because she has a younger sibling. And so I try to help the older one to feel more relaxed and, you know, it's okay and we still love you as much as we love her and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, there's always that, there's always the possibility in some cases that sometimes the older one feels like, Number two came along, number three came along, and I just had to, you know, go and do chores while they got all the attention. I don't know, something along that line. This parable is about God's grace, though. It's about, it's not just about doing the work, it's about coming home. It's about coming to our senses. And that God welcomes this kind of a new berry as a full member of the household, and he expects the same welcome from the older brother. So the point that I want to make here is that in some congregations, the original berries can sometimes feel like the new berries haven't earned their place. Does that make sense? Sometimes they can feel like, well, we've been here forever and we've done all this work, and you know, here comes somebody along and they're starting to you know, do whatever. Our original berries here at First Christian, I think, are not like that. I think you're a little bit different. I think you've been very welcoming, you've been very supportive, and so don't think for a minute that I'm chastising anybody. In fact, this is what I want to say about our original berries. Those of you who were here in 2016 when I came, this is what I want to say to you. You are invested in this congregation. Six years ago when things looked bleak, and I remember that Sunday, I sat right over here on this side for some reason, and I looked out, at about one-fourth the number of people are here right now. And I felt that there was no air in this room. A little bit of a panic attack. Well, uh-oh, what am I getting myself into, right? What am, I, what am I getting into? And then 30 seconds later, I'm like, no, this is where God wants me to be. I am sure this is where I need to be, and I calm down, and everything's fine. You were here. You kept this church alive. You supported it with your blood, your sweat, and your tears. And when things looked bleak, 
You were the heroes that did not quit. You did not give up. You did not go away. We are forever grateful to you. And I'm sure that when you pass on and you are entering through those pearly gates, you will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I have no doubt of it. You are good and faithful servants without question. You were the life support of FCCA, and you continue to be the life support. And I'm happy to say that I have not seen that older brother attitude in you. You have been welcoming to our new berries. So I'd like for you to think of yourselves as kind of like that older brother or sister who's not jealous or threatened by that younger brother or sister, right? You know, like, like Kim is, right? The very warm and loving and supportive. And there, there we go. Best friends right there. See, you don't have to have a fight later on. I got that all patched over really good. And if you wonder from time to time if these Newberries are as committed as you are, just think about your Newberry days. What was it like when you were a Newberry? Did you have to prove yourself? Did somebody kind of look at you like, eh, I don't know about that guy, I know about that woman? Well, you've proven yourself, and we're going to give everybody else a chance to prove themselves. So, for our Newberries, I selected Romans 11, verses 17 through 18, which is addressed to Gentile Christians and their relationship to Jewish Christians. Now, this may sound a little weird to us today. Gentile Christians, Jewish Christians, aren't we all Gentiles? Well, in the early church, the original church, they were Jewish people who believed in Jesus. And that means that they grew up eating kosher food, circumcising their male children, and going to the temple, right? So when Jesus says to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, the word nations in Hebrew is the same as the word that we use for Gentile. And so Paul said that must be what he means. And so Paul went out to Greece and Rome and Macedonia and, and all these other places. And he preached the gospel to Gentiles who ate pork and cheeseburgers and shrimp cocktail, things that were not kosher. People who did not circumcise their male children and people who had no idea what, you know, the, the Jewish temple was. And they were believers in Christ. And Paul says, you are a member of the church. And the members of the Jewish community who believed in Jesus said, should we let this go or should we not let this go? And ultimately they decided that this was acceptable to God. That God did not require Gentiles to follow the Jewish ritual law, but instead God required people to repent, to believe, and to uh, live a life faithful to the gospel. But Paul wrote these words to the church in Rome that had both Jewish members and Gentile members. They were all Christians, but some were Jewish by birth and by upbringing, and some were Gentile by birth and by upbringing. So imagine what happens when you take people who have been following the law of Moses, who have been circumcised and eating kosher, and you throw in there those Roman pagans, right? And you put them in the same place, and they're all worshiping Jesus. You can see the potential for conflict. You can see the potential for judgment. So uh, Paul said a lot of things to the Jewish believers about welcoming those whom Christ has welcomed. In fact, I've got a little quote of that on our website. And on the other hand, to the Gentiles, to those who were allowed to uh, not follow Jewish ritual law, Paul also had a word to them which basically said, don't get cocky right? You had it easy in some ways, and you received grace from Christ. You received salvation from Christ. Jewish people received salvation through their covenant with God and through the law. Don't think that you're better than they are. Because you see, snobbery can go both ways, can it? My goal as pastor is to hold the past, the present, and the future together. And I will continue to honor and appreciate and extol the virtues of our original berries. I would not be here if it were not for you. But the truth is, none of us would be here if it were not for you. Right? But we will also continue to encourage the growth of new berries, 
to come and to add their gifts as this stream continues to flow through history. We are not stepping into the same stream this year that we stepped into six years ago. You're not stepping into the same stream that some of you stepped into 80 years ago. It is always a constantly changing stream. Each one of us, past, present, and future, we all have a hand in this great legacy. And that's what a day of homecoming is for, is to celebrate this great legacy. Well, as I'm getting set up here, I thought uh, some words that were kind of interesting. Um, Anne and I chose this song prior to Hurricane Ian. And I think now more than obviously before for Homecoming, this song probably means much, much more and is much more relevant. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high, and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm, is a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart and your name. Don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm is a golden sky and the sweet silver song of the law walk on through the wind walk on through the rain though your dreams be tossed and blown walk on walk on with hope in your heart and you'll never walk alone you'll never walk Our 
closing hymn today is different from what's printed in the bulletin. I made a mistake, but I corrected it in the slides. Our hymn this morning is 340 in the hymnal, but it will also be up here. It was requested by one of our old berries, I mean original berries, Pete Adamson. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Would you stand for our hymn of invitation? Today has been a wonderful day of homecoming for you, not just for you original berries or old berries or whatever you are, but also for new berries and for first timers and for all the rest of you. Church is a great place to call home. You can't choose the family you were born into, but you can choose the family that you worship with. And we hope that you will consider First Christian Church of Atlanta a warm and welcoming place to be. Before I dismiss you, let us have a word of blessing for the food. That way we're not awkwardly trying to figure out to go through the line or not go, not go through the line. There is a lot of food back there, and we want you all to stay and go back and make a plate and sit down and have a good time. So let us pray and then end with a blessing. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you have brought us here today and for the blessings that we have, we have received from you. And thank you for the triumphs that we celebrate and also for all the, the low times that we remember, that we know you are faithful through all of these. Bless our time of fellowship. We thank you for the food that has been prepared and ask you to bless our bodies as we partake of it. And now, O oh Lord, bless us, most loving, provident God. May this coming home be a recreation and experience of hospitality and hope. May all who enter this place, may all who walk through these doors know and feel your love and presence. Watch over our going out and our coming in so that no one is a stranger, but all are welcome. No one is an alien but all our friends. May the life celebrated here give delight and honor and reverence to you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.